What's up? This is Dark Side. Just want to give you guys a quick editor's note. Beginning of this interview, we had a little bit of signal issue where it was cutting out some, so we regrouped with FaceTime audio so it does get better. Just stick with it, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, guys. Today, I've got another guest from Race Tech. It's the director of marketing, Chris Riesenberg, our boy Checkers. What's up, Checkers? Uh, just enjoying a Monday, getting back in the office, trying to focus on getting through some emails instead of trying to find out more information on this Barsha T-Bone. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what everybody's trying to look it into, isn't it? That's the big news right now. Yeah, absolutely. I guess it's uh, it's part of being a fan of the sport. All right, well, let's get into you. You are the Director of Marketing for Race Tech. Give us a little bit of your background, where you came from. How did you get involved with Race Tech? Um, well, like most people, I would say that work in the industry, I, I grew up riding dirt bikes. I love dirt bikes um, since I was a little kid and um, kind of chased the dream. I was lucky and fortunate enough to have very supportive parents and sponsors and such growing up that I was able to do a lot of the amateur nationals and Loretta's and that side of things growing up. And I was OK. I was a good local guy. Um, I got to be a, you know, a, a front runner on the local pro scene. And I tried to race one national, the last national ever at Trey, Ohio. Um, it didn't go well. I wasn't very much of an outdoor guy anyways. And honestly, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, and then I did a little bit of arena cross for a while. Um, I was pretty good at that because of my background racing, just fair races and money races and stuff and all that growing up. But I was never going to make a career out of racing dirt bikes. I just, I made the decision to go to college, um, which I quick, kind of quickly learned after about two and a half years of college that that really wasn't for me. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to do something different and I happened to stumble into go work for um, Rainbow Studios on the MX versus ATV games as a track designer. Oh, and it cool. was something I was doing kind of as a hobby um, for some of the games that had already been released, uh, modding them and they saw some of my work and the job was available. And I inquired about it, asking basically, how do I go to school for this to learn it? And they surprised me with a phone interview and a flight to out to Arizona for a a job interview and hired me on the spot. So um, I started down that road, which kind of led my foot into the industry and make the best MX game possible. And part of doing that, I started working with like the industry companies and riders. Like we signed up pretty much every privateer you could imagine to be in the game. And the most guys that they, they had in the game before I started was like 10 guys max and they were paying all of them. And I was like, you're doing this wrong. Like the value it's to all the companies that like the gear company that's on the riders and stuff. Let's go to them and ask them to help get the riders signed up in the game. And I was like, all these privateer guys, it's a dream for them to be in there. Like, let's go add some authenticity to the game and give them an opportunity for something cool. And we ended up like with 90 riders or something like that in um, a couple of the titles. So um, that made it really easy for me to learn kind of who all the privateer guys were. And they were all stoked to meet me because they wanted to be in a game. Um, and we transitioned to moving on the company side of, well, how can the comp get these companies like an FMF, for instance, or a Charlie Designs? Like, hey, you guys are in the game already with like hay bales and stuff, which adds awesome authenticity and their free marketing out of it. But what can we do on our side to maybe add a little bit of extra in the game for you? But on the other side, you guys go to your social media channels and stuff like that and promote the title coming out. So it's a it's a win-win for everyone. And I mean, the biggest project that I got to was I ended up working with Red Bull and we got James Stewart on the cover and the compound in the game. And that was really sick. Like that was a really cool deal. And I had no experience on the, I would say marketing side prior to that. I just, I learned as we went, um, and I had no budget to work with, but transitioning out of the, the MX versus ATV stuff, basically the title got to a point where I didn't feel like it was getting any better. Um, and I, like I said, when I went there, my goal was to work on the best motocross game on the market. And I wasn't seeing the progress I wanted. I was getting really frustrated. A lot of it was on the corporate side, not necessarily on our, our side in house. And it got to the point where I was just frustrated. And I called my current boss, um, Rob Brown. He's been, he was my suspension guy of the last year I raced arena cross and we'd become pretty good buddies. And he was working at race tech at the time. Um, and I had done some stuff with him before he went to race tech at his old company for PR performance back in Illinois. Just, I did designed a logo for him and a website and kind of just some general marketing stuff. And I didn't know it was marketing at the time. I was just helping a buddy out. And yeah. I just called him on the way home frustrated from work because I was again, not working on the title. I wanted it to be and said, Hey, if you know of anything in the industry, let me know. Cause I, I don't want to go anywhere that's not in the industry, but, um, I'm looking for something new and, he goes, well, actually, I, I kind of want a marketing guy, and you'd be perfect for it. 
and he put me in touch with Paul and kind of pushed to make that whole process happen. And um, I transitioned over to race tech again with really no marketing experience. Um, and I sat down on the job the first day and I realized that it's not a marketing department. I am the marketing department <laughs> <laughs> and kind of got thrown to the wolves. And I just basically what Paul and Rob said, and it, it stuck with me to this day is it's okay. You'll figure it out. It's okay to make mistakes. Just don't make them twice. And so they gave me the freedom to really do what I wanted to do. And if it went wrong, I wasn't in trouble for it as long as I learned from it. Um, and so I used the connections that I had with all the privateer guys. And, you know, our goal was when I started, I was a year behind Rob going there. And when Rob went there, he basically reinvented the, the race tech product. I would say as a whole, I would say the name of race tech at the time was, was less than stellar. I mean, we had, I think one or two guys on the pro, the pro series running race tech really the so our goal was let's get this product out there and show people that it doesn't suck and um i so i started calling all the privateer guys i could and we rob and um aj at the time was our track side support guy i mean they were at milestone doing supercross testing two or three times a week um just out the track and it started to snowball the, the privateer guys out there saw that well these guys that are using the stuff the bikes are working well and these guys are here providing support and you know, they would be over by the box fan talking and one thing after another, the next thing you know, I mean, half the night shows on race tech. <laughs> so, um, with race tech, the, the goal is always product driven, I guess I would say, um, versus brand driven. And we figure if we have a good product, the brand stuff will follow and people want to be a part of it. So we chose to go down a route of how do we develop the best product? And that's work with a lot of privateers. Because then we get a lot of different riders riding a lot of different motorcycles across all brands. And what that allows us to do is, you know, develop a great Cowie 250F setting for somebody and a great Honda 250F setting for somebody and so on and so forth with lots of feedback and lots of different riders versus, you know, going the team direction is really good for building a brand and getting really good results, which the racer in me always wants to go after. Well, I want to win races and championships. Um, The fact is, is, it requires you to write a pretty big check for that. And then you de- dedicate a lot of time and effort towards a small group of riders and one model specifically. And you're going to have really, really good settings for them. But that also comes along with your testing linkages and chassis type stuff as well, instead of just dialing in suspension itself. So we focus on suspension, suspension, suspension. As we find areas where the suspension can benefit from a chassis improvement, across each model, we'll make a recommendation to our privateer guys of, Hey, maybe you should look into doing a different offset on your clamps or a linkage. And then when they do that, well, because they're always looking for performance to help themselves. Then we get a test with that setting and changes as well. So we get that feedback just in a little bit different way. Um, And the fact of the matter is it's really rewarding to help guys achieve their goals. And no matter what that is, whether that's in Supercross, you know, we have a lot of guys that we help out, and they maybe haven't ever made a night show. And when they make their first night show, they're pumped. We've helped guys make their first main events. We've had guys get top tens or even podiums. Um, and not that many privateer brands can, can, or not that many privateers go on the podium. And we're pretty stoked to be one of the few brands that has been able to help guys do that. So it's really rewarding. It's really fun. And we get to help a lot of guys out that genuinely really appreciate the support um, versus, you know, a lot of times, I feel bad for suspension tuners on race teams, honestly, because they get blamed a lot. And yeah. a lot of times it's just personal personalities and result, results driven. I mean, you can't tell me that the factory tuners are that far off that a bike's unrideable, in, in my opinion. You've talked about wanting to focus on privateers, but what is it about race tech that you think that makes the privateers want to come to you? Well, I mean, there's, there's really, I would say probably three things. Um, one is just the support in general, and it's, we're willing to pay attention to them. We aren't distracted by um, a, a very high-level race team effort where a lot of our, our staff has to put their attention to. So we're able to spread it across the privateers in general. And along with the support goes at the races, they have support because there's race tech centers all around the country. You know, you, you get into nationals and guys are on the East Coast and need a rebuild, and they don't have time between races to ship stuff back and forth. And a lot of times they don't have a spare set of suspension. They maybe have a practice bike and a race bike, but they don't want to be swapping stuff. They have enough going on driving to the races. So for me to locate a service center in their area that they can go to during the week or even one that's at the races every weekend to provide that support for them to do a rebuild or if a seal pops or any type of setting change or anything like that, 
they have support around the country. Um, so I think those are two huge ones. And then the final one is the stuff works. It's proven to work. And we're also one of the companies that you don't have to go buy a kit stuff to be competitive and make it work. I mean, all the way back for, I don't know if you remember the, the KTM 4CS fork that came production for a while. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was absolutely terrible. We put those in a Supercross main event. Everyone else is saying, well, you just throw those things in the trash and get cone belts. Yes, that's a that's an option and it is a better option than, but if you don't have the budget for it, we're able to work within your budget to give you something to be competitive on at a very high level with a production setup if needed. If you have kit stuff, great. I mean, we, we're a WP authorized center. We sell a lot of cone valve stuff. We can set it up for you and make it work. Um, and then on the engine side, it, it really comes down to a really, really good engine package that also has reliability. And I mean, that was back with, uh, and the things have gone back off the rails. But when I first worked with Jerry Robin, I told him, dude, you're pushing your bike off every single moto. And that was bike problems. That wasn't him at that time. And I said, let me give you a package that's competitive, but your bike isn't going to break. And he was pulling whole shots at nationals and he did one rebuild the whole summer. And I think he finished all but like two motos that summer. And then it went back off the rails, but that was a 250F engine package that, I mean, he could have probably made it through the national season without even rebuilding the thing. And it was good enough to pull whole shots with a good starter on it. And I'm not saying that it's a factory engine by any means, but it's close enough to be competitive and it's run up front and it's proven and they're reliable. And I think, you know, when it comes to a privateer working on a budget or a local racer, again, a local racer doesn't want a bike that they have to rebuild every five hours. That doesn't work. That's not within the budget for most of these guys. So working with the privateers, again, it allows us to perfect our product in the realm of where our customers are actually at. I don't know know that everybody realizes you guys do engines. I mean- Absolutely. We have to handle the engine side a bit differently because we don't want to be engine builders. We want to be an engine machine shop. Mm-hmm. And what that means is we are developing a really good engine package in-house, and we want to provide the machining work to provide you a good head, and we'll give you recommended parts, and we'll tune the ECU for you, but we want to send it to either yourself or another engine builder to make the thing, put the thing together and, and that side of things. And so what you see at the end of the day is there's a lot of our stuff out there that you don't know ever came from our shop. And that's okay. We're fine with that because as long as we're growing their businesses by giving them a great product, then we're doing our job on our end. I mean, our engine department is, is overwhelmingly busy right now. Uh, We keep staffing it up and working on the process to make it faster and faster and just trying to keep up as, it's wide open. So um, <laughs> although on the outside, you maybe don't hear or see as much about it, there's a lot of business going on there and we're making a lot of horsepower and you just might not see our name on stuff as much because the end product doesn't come out of our shop. Right. Okay. When it comes to marketing, which obviously you're the director of marketing, the things have changed over the last, let's say 10 years with social media. The physical magazine is not quite as prevalent as it used to be. How do you deal with learning what the evolution of marketing is? What's the next be- best thing? What works the best? Well, I mean, it's an ongoing learning process, and I'd be lying if I told you I had all the answers because, as I told you, I don't really have any formal education. I yeah. just have experience to go off of, and in the 11 years I've been doing it, it's changed a ton. I mean, when I first started, it was absolutely still working with all the privateer guys and that side of things and, and local racing in general, um, grassroots racing is a huge part of what we do as well. Um, you won't see very many amateur events go off without race tech being part of them. And then, um, but the side that has changed a lot, it was magazines and magazine editors and getting our product on magazines, feature stories. We still do that, but it used to be, that was the most important thing you could possibly do. Now it's still important to be there for the guys that are reading print and to have the relationships, but a lot of the stuff has shifted to video and online and podcasts and social stuff, and I mean, building social media programs, I mean, I've been doing that, and we've been pretty successful with it, and it's good, but it's just a learning experience, and it's definitely changed the dynamic, and it is really difficult for me as somebody who's just a fan of the sport and the industry and wants the industry and the sport to grow, to go and pay a bunch of money to Facebook or Instagram for just generic Facebook and Instagram ads. Um versus supporting a media outlet that's going to the races and supporting the industry. It's a really, that's a really big challenge for me. It's something that we do do for our um, seminars because we're trying to reach a different audience for that. 
But for the most part, I try to keep as much of our advertising money endemic as possible within the industry. One of the many things that Paul told me when we started was we're not a branding company of go out and pay to slap your logo all over everything. That's not who we are. We are a performance company. So the best way to sell race tech is through word of mouth. And so everything I do is based around word of mouth. And it's getting people to try the product and talk about the product. So even with the Pulp MX show, that only works because I put Steve on race tech suspension and he can share his real opinion of it. The same with the Kiefer's of the world or the Jamie from Vitals of the world or the Michael Lindsay's of Vital from the world. I want them to try the product, believe in the product, and then share their experiences with it. In a podcast form, it is all about talking. That's what they're doing. So it definitely works well. And f- absolutely, there's a there's a large Pulp Nation army out there that, that definitely support what Steve does in in everything that goes on there and the brands that support him. And it's a great way to get a message across about this is what we're doing. This is who we are. And at the end of the day, we're just fans of the sport that happen to work really hard to make a great product. I want to talk about racetech.com for a moment. There's some things on there that maybe the consumer, the listener, the reader isn't aware of. There's a lot of us that just don't understand what we need in our suspension how we need to set our suspension. There's a lot of tools on your website to help with that. Can you talk about those? Absolutely. The website is a plethora of information, which is, it's my best friend and my worst enemy. <laughs> okay. um, we are constantly working to evolve the website to make it better and easier for users to find what they're, what they're looking for because there is a lot of information there. The problem is it takes a lot of time because it's a lot of different stuff to go through and a lot of information to go through. So it's actually part of my job that is is one of the most stressful and time-consuming ones is trying to make information presentable. Key things to find on there really is if you go to our product search, it's not just a listing of products for your bike, but you go on there and you can find spring rates that we recommend for your bike as well as all the spring rates that are available. We'll give you oil levels and all that side of things as well, where to set your sag recommended as well. Um, air pressures if you're on an air fork and also there's just general notes about the suspension in general whether you're tearing the fork completely apart or if you're setting it up as a user and the other side of things that we have on there is there's instructions on there that are step by step on how to rebuild or revalve your suspension or 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 modify it or even all the way to putting your forks on your dirt bike properly so that they're parallel because i will tell you i got back from loretta's not long ago and you guys come over and complain about a harsh front end nine times out of ten the reason why is their forks aren't parallel they got they bind it up their their forks when they put their front wheel on their bike mm, yeah Loose in the axle nuts and all of a sudden the bike's amazing um and i've had this with a well-known media outlet we went out testing one day and they said it was one of the worst setups they've ever ridden and it was a proven setup that we've used for years so we, we had a pretty good idea that it wasn't the actual setting and loosened the axle and the pinch bolts and it, the fork went Ting! oh jeez hop back into place and they tighten it back up and the riders the test rider looked at him like you're not going to touch it he goes go ride it and they came back and like this is incredible and they said we re-screw it up so that i can feel what it was like before and go back and forth and they did that and it was amazing i'm like that's a media outlet that's been telling people that their stuff's good or bad for ages and who knows if it was our stuff or somebody else's that got reviewed that the stuff was terrible and it really wasn't the suspension. It was the way that they put the, the front wow. wheel on the motorcycle. Yeah. Um, but so there's that. That's on there. There's step-by-step instructions is what I was getting to of, of that. And if you want to look at, well, maybe I can rebuild my own stuff. It'll give you the instructions, the tools required. And you can go through all the steps and say, oh, you know what? I can handle that. I can do it. Or absolutely, I cannot do that. I need to find my local race tech center in my area and send them my stuff to get it rebuilt or revalved. Or I'm going to send it out to California and, and have them do it and I mean, the fact is, if you need special tools for it, we also have and a full listing of tools that we sell of that are, you know, our business is really built around other people building suspension. Yes, we have a service department in-house, um, but we look at that really as R&D and marketing. So we're always testing and tuning and learning and getting feedback on the R&D side and, and putting stickers on the bike on a marketing side, on a rider support side. But the main driver of race tech's business is the warehouse in the back and selling parts and tools and bits and pieces and gold valves to other tuners. And even if people aren't using, you know, people would say they're our competitors and maybe they're not even using gold valves. A lot of them are buying springs from us or they're buying seals or bushings or, you know, uh, we have a rebound separator valve for the shock. That's something that really no one else is offering. And 
so they buy those types of stuff from us. And that's really a lot of race tech's business and, and what allows the whole machine to keep going. And for those that do maybe want to take on the task of working on their own stuff or learning, RaceTech also offers seminars. Yeah, so once a year, it's a week-long um, course, and it's split up into three different classes. Um, we teach suspension and the ins and outs, and Paul and Rob use their years of experience. And many, many, many careers within the industry have started there. Um, they're coming up in the fall, I believe, in November. The information's um, on the seminars tab at the website, but... So as of last week when I checked, I believe they're selling 45 seats and 20 of them are already sold. So, I mean, we haven't even really started a marketing program for that. A lot of that's overflow from last year's class that um, weren't able to get in last year. So they're trying to now. So if it's something you want to do and are interested in, whether it's to start your own business, um, building suspension, or maybe you have, you know, a motorcycle shop already and you want to add to the service department. Um, and you want to learn suspension, it's a really, you know, obviously it's a way to be profitable and, and make money. Or uh, we have a lot of parents or guys that, you know, they run a race team or work for a race team or want to work for a race team. They'll come through because it's a specialized skill that they can provide that's, you know, next level just to help tune in their own motorcycles and that side of things. And I mean, the seminar really, it pays for itself after just a few sets of suspension that you've built. So um, it's not a super big expense. And the reason that is, I mean, Paul's basically giving away years and years of knowledge for almost nothing, but it's all goes back to, we want more suspension tuners out there because that allows everything else to work well in our business. As far as, you know, we can, we can provide you with parts and, you know, fluids and bushings and seals and springs and valves and, and all that side of things. So um, it's in our best interest to get as many people out there and tuning suspension as we can, which, People I know when Paul started that program thought he was absolutely insane, but it's it's worked out and it's allowed us to have a lot of really cool relationships with the industry because there's no such thing as a competitor. You know, like we're all in this together to educate people on you need to get your suspension serviced and whoever you choose to work with is is absolutely fine on that. The goal is to work together to get more people to understand that their suspension can be better. How does a, a local shop, we just talked about the seminar, let's say there's a shop in, you know, my local town and the guy wants to become a race tech service center. How do they go about that? Well, it's a really tricky question. Okay. Because much like the website, it's my best friend and my worst enemy. <laughs> Anyone that has a motorcycle shop or dealership, um, or at least, you know, has the business license to be a shop or a dealership can get the Racetech product and there's a dealer application right on Racetech.com and you can sign up to be a dealer and you can get our full in our full inventory of parts and along with every gold valve kit you buy, whether you're a shop or a consumer, it comes with a DVS access code to get your personalized setting. It comes with tech support if you have questions on the install or maybe need a specialized setting or something along those lines. So pretty much anyone can do it. And the reason I say that it's my best friend and my worst enemy is I only recommend this for somebody that actually knows what they're doing because the product is only as good as the install. Mm -hmm. And so many times I have people say, man, I had race tech stuff. It sucked. It was terrible. And the first question I ask, where did you have it installed? Oh, my buddy did it in his garage down the street. Okay. Um, have you ever had anybody that's a suspension expert look at it? Well, no, my buddy did it and he, he did it for free or he charged me 200 bucks or, or whatever it is. And if I get them to send the stuff to California, we tear it apart. And 98.8% of the time, and I'm making that up, shout up because it's probably a higher percentage, it is an install error that tolerances are very important. Using the proper fluid is extremely important. You know, if you have a question, stop and ask. It is not the hardest thing in the world to build a set of suspension. It takes some experience to build it absolutely properly. Or taking the time to ask somebody that's experienced, which is why we have tech support. So I want the product out there and I want it to be installed right. Um, so that's the dealer program. And then from there, once you've been a dealer for over a year, if there's availability in your area and you approach us about a race tech center, then you go through. You have to be, have gone through the seminars, which you don't have to go through the seminars um, to be a dealer or anything like that. And you don't have to be wanting to become a center to go through the seminars. You can do them just because you want to learn. But to become a center, you absolutely have to go through the seminars. You also have to attend. Um, we do what we call um, race tech center development meetings um, annually. And I think it's once every two or three years. You have to attend those as a race tech center as well to stay up to date on the product. 
And there's minimums of sales that you have to make throughout the year to make sure you're you're a serious suspension installer. Um, there's quite a hefty screening process for that. And the reason being, if you're a race tech service center, I want to be able to tell any customer that they can go there and I would trust my personal bike going to that race tech service center to get worked on and to have a good job done with the install. All right. Last question. This is the one everybody wants to know about checkers. How did you become the master of the air wheelie? Well, I think it all started when I was, I was younger. I was not a tiny kid. I actually went from super mini at Loretta's at 12 years old onto a big bike, 125, um, just size. I didn't have a choice. But all the years of riding a 125 and not being the smallest human being meant really stretching jumps out of a corner. Okay, and I don't okay. know if you've ever seen the famous picture of Stu on Rocco's Leap. Yeah. I'm not Stu by any means. But that's how I had to jump like a basic local double out of a corner, it seemed like, to stretch out over the thing. Because I was on a CR 125, which weren't necessarily the fastest, <laughs> and I was bigger. So I learned to put the front end up like pretty easy and confidently. And now I just uh, – now I have power of a 450 and – I just kind of did it by accident once. I mean, it wasn't accidental that I pulled the front end up. We were just messing around goon riding and people were laughing and I saw some pictures of it and I was like, holy crap, that's actually pretty vertical. That's kind of cool. And it just kind of started to make people laugh. So I kept doing it more and more and that became my thing now. So um, if it makes people laugh and I'm going to keep doing it, if people think it's ridiculous, I agree it is ridiculous, <laughs> but I'm not going to stop. After Loretta's last year, Avery Long was at the private track with me, and I put the video up on her Instagram, and he's like, teach me the air wheelie. So I told him, and there's a video of him going to try it. And what he didn't factor in is when you're hitting the jump like he does at speed and scrubbing it, you're just coming up to it a lot faster than I am. And I told him, I was like, to do it, you have to be wide open off the face. And so he didn't slow down ahead of time. And he hits it going off the face wide open and isn't scrubbing and stretching it. He jumped about 40 feet past the landing of the jump and didn't even get close to vertical at all. And I showed him the video and he's like, okay, I have a lot more respect for you now that that you can do it that big. As always, I appreciate the time that you have for me and us. Absolutely. I mean, I don't touch a wrench. And as a racer, I never really, I didn't touch my suspension either. I just rode it. And now that I've been around, it's it's something that's extremely important and can really help you as a rider. So I just encourage people, if you're at the track, there's suspension tuners everywhere around. Don't be afraid to ask and just talk to multiple people and find the one that you like to work with and build a relationship and then stick with them with some loyalty so that they can build something that really works for you and and dial stuff in for you because suspension is just as much relationship as it is product. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day and uh, I'm sure I'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you for the time. Absolutely.